Your grace forever shining like a beacon in the light. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have This morning as we come to the table and we gather around, we're going to do something a little different uh, to sort of set our hearts and minds on taking the Lord's Supper together this morning. We're going to participate uh, in a responsive reading here in just a moment, and uh, you'll see uh, on the screen where it will indicate where the leader will read, which is where I will read, and then where it says congregation, I want to ask you guys to join in, and this will be this will be the prayer, this will be the reading, this will be the time that we start moving our minds to the table. So let's do that this morning. Let us gather around the table with the offering of bread and drink upon it and the promise of the living Christ among us. This is the welcome table of God where all who seek to be at peace with their neighbor and all who seek the mercy of God in Christ are embraced. Come, for we are invited into this holy mystery. Come. We are ready. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. All who come to me shall not hunger, and all who believe in me shall never be thirsty. We are hungry and thirsty, O Lamb of God, we come. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus offered the bread in thanksgiving and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus offered the cup in thanksgiving and said, Take, drink, this is the blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Open our eyes to the mystery of Christ's presence in these ordinary things. In these our ordinary lives. May they be for us the very essence of the living Christ in our midst. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life Christ gives. These are the gifts of God. For the people of God, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Let's participate together in communion.
sixth grade you guys can be dismissed now to children's worship uh, down the hall we've got all kinds of children's ministry volunteers over here ready to greet you and receive you if you're a guest with us this morning and you would like and your child is here and you'd like for them to participate in children's worship we'd love to have you feel free to go down the hall with them and uh, meet our volunteers and see where the kids are they're in a great fun and safe environment uh, down there so well as they're being dismissed. Let's stand and sing one more song together. Just as I am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me.
to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I welcome with open arms, praise God, just as I It's also good to know that so many of you are watching and listening online. It's great for us all to be able to be together in this way. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Luke chapter 18, and I'm going to jump right into it and start reading from Luke 18, verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Two men went up to the temple to pray. It was common in ancient Jerusalem for people to go to the temple where twice a day sacrifices would be offered and incense would be burned. The people believed that as those sacrifices for their sins were being offered, a way to God was opening up, and as the smoke from the incense drifted into the heavens, they would gather in the temple courts to pray, hoping that perhaps their prayers would ascend to the heavens along with the smoke. So two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. He belonged to an ultra-religious group who took pride in their strict obedience to the law of Moses and their observance of their own traditions, which in some cases 
were more rigorous than the law itself. The Pharisees went above and beyond what was necessary to please God. They were the kind of students who always volunteered to do the extra credit project in class. The name Pharisees means those who are set apart, the set apart ones, and they believed it was their obedience, their righteousness that set them apart from everyone else. We tend to vilify the Pharisees because of the way some Pharisees resisted and harassed Jesus in the Gospels. But in the first century, the Pharisees were considered heroes to many because of their superior righteousness. If one day your son came home and said, Mom, Dad, I have big news. I want to be a Pharisee. You would not be alarmed or disappointed. You would be proud. Our son, the Pharisee. So two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other, a tax collector. And tax collectors were as despised as the Pharisees were admired. They were considered by just about everyone to be thieves because of the way they made their living. What they would do is they would inflate their neighbor's tax bill so that they could skim a little profit off the top for themselves and then pass on the rest to the Roman government. They were considered to be traitors because they were working with the Roman government who were unjustly occupying the land. They were considered to be idolaters because their partnership with the Romans meant they were in close relationship with idol worshipers who did not worship the true and living God of Israel. No one liked tax collectors. So two men went up to the the temple to pray one was a pharisee and the other a tax collector one was a hero and the other was a villain and jesus makes a comparison between the two and the story he tells about them is shocking he continues he says the pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. The Pharisee, when he prays, is thankful. Thankful he's not someone else. He thanks God that he was born morally and ethically superior to others. Oh, he could have been born a sinner. Could have been a robber, an, an evildoer, an adulterer, or even a, a terrible tax collector who he sees across the way. And I assume the Pharisee is praying this out loud, loud enough for everyone to hear what he's praying, including the tax collector. It's a clever prayer, really. Somehow the Pharisee manages to lift himself up, put someone else down, and give God the credit for the difference. He's able to draw all attention to himself through his prayer. I have a good friend who is a master of asking questions in such a way that when you answer, it gives him an opportunity to talk more about himself. You know those people. All right, all right, all right, enough about me. Let's talk about you. So what do you think of me? The Pharisee does not see this as an occasion to ask for forgiveness. He sees prayer as an opportunity to brag about his righteousness. He does not list his sins, his shortcomings, his failures. He lists his accomplishments. And if you were to overhear this prayer while at the temple, you'd likely be impressed by it. And maybe even feel a little guilty because you're not fasting and tithing as much as the Pharisee. And that's what makes Pharisees Pharisees. 
the set apart ones they are religious heroes oh if only I could be more like that Pharisee meanwhile the tax collector stood at a distance he would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said God have mercy on me a sinner the tax collector's a wreck He dare not approach with the crowd. He knows he's an outsider. He knows how others feel about him. He can't even look up to heaven in a gesture of grief. All he can do is beat his chest. And his prayer is so simple. Just have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And compared to the Pharisees' prayer, that prayer is not much. If you overheard the tax collector praying, you, especially after hearing the Pharisee pray, you would think, well, he doesn't have a chance of getting his prayer answered. In fact, that thieving, traitorous, idolatrous tax collector has got some chutzpah coming down to the temple asking for mercy. He's wasting his time. And then comes the surprising twist in the story. Jesus says, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus says, actually, it's the Pharisee who's wasting his time. It's the tax collector The villain, not the hero, the villain who goes home justified or right with God or forgiven of his sins. The Pharisee, the hero in the story, goes home unforgiven. His prayer was meaningless. All his fasting and tithing and all his other religious acts of devotion were pointless, useless. Because his prayer lacked an essential characteristic that God requires of those who seek him. It's a characteristic that David names well in one of his psalms, Psalm 51, verse 16 and 17. David says, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken spirit. And contrite heart, you, O God, will not despise. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was righteous, and the other a sinner. And it is the sinner who goes home with a blessing from God, not the righteous one. So the righteous one is so caught up in who he is and what he's doing that he doesn't even bother to ask God for forgiveness. And the sinner leaves forgiven because he brings to God what really matters, a broken, contrite heart. Luke tells us at the beginning of the story that Jesus told it as a way of taking down those who were taking too much pride in their own righteousness. But this story also has something important to teach us about prayer. It teaches us that the heart of prayer is more important than the art of prayer. The heart of prayer is more important than the art of prayer. If you find yourself stuck or not sure how to pray or even afraid to pray because you don't know the right words or the right forms or the right formula, it is not using the perfect words that moves God to act on our behalf. It's the broken heart before God behind the words that matter. If we're not approaching God in humility, if 
We're not approaching God with a broken heart, with unpretentious trust in our Father in heaven. It does not matter what words we pray or how many times we repeat them or how long or ornate or fancy or theologically sophisticated our prayers are. It doesn't matter how often we fast. It does not matter how much money we give to the church. If we're approaching God with self-righteous pride, we can expect to leave the temple, church, prayer time, just like the Pharisee. Proud, but unforgiven. Before this message, we sang the song, Just As I Am, and It occurred to me as we were singing that song, that's almost true. You can approach God just as you are as long as you're not self-righteous. You can approach God with a broken heart. You can approach God beating your chest. You can approach God knowing that you're failing and you're falling over and over and over again. But if you approach God just as you are and who you are is self-righteous because of who you are and all the good things you do, well... Jesus has a story for you. This little story has inspired a short prayer that's come to be known as the Jesus Prayer. We'll put it up on the screen. It's a simple little prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Just like with the Lord's Prayer, I taught my boys when they were little to pray the Jesus Prayer. And one night, they were getting ready for bed. Caleb, my oldest son, prayed out loud. Two boys shared a room. He prayed out loud, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on Elijah. He's a sinner. Like, no, that's not the way this prayer works. We don't pray this prayer for other people. We don't pray this prayer for the tax collectors in our lives. This one is for us. I try to pray the Lord's Prayer once a day, at least, but I pray this prayer all the time, repeatedly throughout the day. You can even turn it into a breath prayer, if you like. You can inhale the good news about Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, and you can exhale the bad news about you. Have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. This prayer keeps me centered. Never lets me forget who Jesus is. He's the Lord, he's the Christ, he's the Son of God, and it also never lets me forget who I am. As much as it stings, I am a sinner in continual need of God's mercy. Would you stand with me and let's pray this prayer together? But only if you mean it. Don't mess with this prayer. Don't pretend this prayer. We'll pray this one out loud together and then we will close as is becoming our custom with the Lord's Prayer. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now the Lord's Prayer with boldness. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us today our daily bread forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace and enjoy the summer celebration outside.